So we are now moving into the concluding session. Um, we've agreed between Tony and I that I will focus on just concluding. Um, I have a couple of words to say about the wrapping up. Let me start these concluding remarks by thanking, first of all, all of the speakers today, the authors from a global network of researchers, policymakers, and say that it has been both extremely interesting, but also very educating to be here today. I'd like to appreciate the participation of all of those who are available in this room, but also those who have followed in other ways. Thank you very much to our donors. Thank you, Danita, for providing these facilities. Here we can actually, even it is a bit dark outside, we still have had light during the day, and at least we have seen some strikes of light hitting on occasional insights into these very difficult issues. Thank you very much, Karen and Joel, for doing all the hard work on organizing, on getting the themes together, on getting the discussions panels lined up. Thank you very much to key participants throughout the day. I would also like to use the opportunity to express my thanks um, to the wider staff uh, who have been supporting the implementation of this in collaboration with other partners. And um, sitting behind there in the back, I'd also like to say that it's been a pleasure that we've actually been able to communicate today, both because we want to communicate, but also because you've taken care of the technical aspects of the meeting. That is appreciated. Now, if I may, I mean, I'm an, I'm an employee of a UN organization, and we do have something that's called the Declaration of Human Rights, and it is meant to be a universal document. It does transpire values. It does transpire values that cuts across gender, religions, peoples, nations. I think it's important for all of us to remember that that document has been signed and at least as far as I'm concerned, is a reference document for all of what we do. Having said that, where the rights are then an easy tool, an easy operational guide, is a slightly different question. But equal rights is core business of the international development community, and it's core business throughout and should be. But of course, it's not always easy to say exactly how you achieve these goals when you are in concrete situations where there might be trade-offs involved. It's not always easy to decide whether you provide water in a distant rural locality, because that may come at a trade-off with other things that you can also do. But human rights are fundamental to the work of the UN, and it does transpire values that cuts across. Now, when I think about operational guidelines, when I think about how to achieve gender equality, well, one thing that comes to mind, and that may reflect my professional background, but it actually also does reflect quite a lot of field experience, quite a lot of grappling with household surveys and what they tell me, and being out there observing what people actually do is that time is of the essence. How you can liberate pressures on women's time and choices, as far as I understand it, are fundamental. How you can make sure that you get those cassava roots into the production system, such that women are not tied to making sure that the household survives, but actually, through better root crops, has to use less time on survival and has other time, more time, for pursuing other needs, I believe, is part of the fundamental challenge that we are all facing. And I actually tend to believe that that is an essential element of promoting gender equality. Now, choices, choices can be extended, choices can be made possible through family planning, they can be made possible through availability of employment. 
They can be made possible through investment such that you can easier have access to services and so on. But I do believe that these two things, time and the possibility for making your own choices, are fundamental uh, in all of this. And that obviously leads to a very large agenda of things, of policies and concrete measures that can be done. Out of today's deliberations, as well as the background work that has been happening within RECOM, there will be a so-called position paper on aid and gender. It is being finalized, and I'd like to encourage everyone who has not had a chance or upon reflection after this meeting has something, has a comment, has an input into that, that they please send it to us. And if you do forget an email or so, let me say that there will be one address, which is Finn, my first name, ertweider.unu.edu, and I will make sure that those comments are on the one hand both posted, but also included uh, in the synthesis document. We will be trying to synthesize those lessons, and we will be doing that over the coming months. Now, today's result meeting, it is the last recom meeting uh, of this nature, but if obviously, and that has been clear throughout the deliberations today, it's not the end of the work. In many ways, it's only the beginning, or at least the continuation. At WIDER, our 2014-18 to 18 work program will begin on the 1st of January 2014. It's based on the following prem premise, is that development involves transformation, inclusion, and sustainability. We hope that we can jointly with our partners continue to build on the work done in RECOM and build on the premise that development involves transformation of economies, but also human lives, of relationships between the gender. It's not always that men don't understand. I think it's important when we are reflecting on these things is that there are costs and there are benefits involved, and sometimes the benefits, they come maybe only in the longer run. That is a comment as to when men oppose we need to figure out how we can make sure that those short-run costs that they sometimes face, that they are minimized and that they are removed. Some of us have been fortunate to be in situations where we see the long-run benefits from gender equality. Let's try and make sure that that's also kept on the agenda, how we minimize those trade-offs that are there, perceived or real. Now, I, I, I sort of, when we're thinking about the post-2015 development agenda, I, I've actually been sort of reflecting quite a lot on it because I do happen uh, to be the UNU representative on the UN task team for the post-2015 development agenda. And yes, I can certainly confirm that from WIDER's perspective, we are trying to provide a platform. We will be available as a platform that can be used by all actors in this to the extent that this is desired. And that's a confirmation that I would also say that I am making available that platform to the extent that we can. This is fully supported by our board and it is written into our work program that this should be core and center over the coming years. Now reflecting more broadly about the 2015, uh, post-2015 development agenda, I, I kind of have to admit that while, yes, my professional background is an economist, so I do like numbers, I do like indicators, I think it's very important that we do not get hung up on one or another specific indicator. In my understanding, the development process is actually quite composite. And when we try to do studies and analysis of how different indicators relate, and we do something that's called first order dominance to try to figure out whether we can come out with unidimensional messages, we do face some difficulties. So I would suggest that it's important in this post-2015 development discussion that we remember 
that any successful progress will need to be based on national plans, national priorities, in partnership with the international community. Only through that partnership can one actually ensure that success is what we get out of it. I think that that is at least one of the things that I am trying to suggest is let's try to sort of make sure that we keep in mind the transformation issues, that's transformation of econo economies, of their structures, the relationship between sectors, and the relationship between men and women, between different societal groups. Transformation cuts across all of that. Inclusion has to be fundamental, because if there are smaller or bigger, the biggest parts of society that are not included, development is not occurring. Then we are not living up to our obligations to promote human rights, the general principles that we have all signed to. I hope that you have enjoyed the day as much as I have. I've certainly learned a lot. I realize that a lot needs to be done. Let's all continue the work, and I would like to thank you very much, all of you, for your active participation and engagement, and I wish you all a very good evening. And before we conclude, may I ask you to think about whether you would spend just one minute, maybe even less, there is a feedback form lying on the table in front of you. We would appreciate if you would fill that in. Thank you very much all, and have a good evening.